The Churches of Christ presents Speaking the Truth in Love, a program bringing you life's answers from the Word of God. Thank you for joining us for our program. I'm James Johnston, the minister of Nettleton Church of Christ in Jonesboro, Arkansas. Our program is brought to you by the Area Churches of Christ, which are listed at the end of the program. To help you grow in your relationship with God, we're offering free resources on both our Facebook page and our website. Our speaker today is Joshua DeMint, the minister of Pyron Street Church of Christ in Pocahontas, Arkansas. Last week we began a series of lessons on God's gifts to man. And certainly God has gifted us with many precious and priceless gifts which not only display His love for man, but also His desire to provide us with the things that we need to live a faithful Christian life, but also to prepare us for that eternal life in heaven which is to come. In that first lesson, we discussed the gift of human life and how each person has value because we are created in the image of God. We noted that our value is not determined based upon our strengths or our weaknesses, but it is determined by our Creator. We are created in the image of God and as such we have great value. God sees us as possessing that great value, therefore we do not need to go through life belittling ourselves or, or condescending ourselves in any way, not allowing ourselves to be racked with insecurity and fear because we recognize that value that our Creator places in us. Therefore we need to use the unique set of skills and abilities and our life experiences to serve God and our fellow man. And we recognize that in doing so, we will be blessed by God. Today we're going to look at another of the wonderful gifts that we have received from our Heavenly Father, and that is the gift of God's love and patience displayed in His sparing of mankind. We recognize that this love and this patience must be great because God is well within His rights as our Creator, and certainly in response to the rebellion of man against the will of God, God would have been well within His rights to destroy all of mankind and send all of mankind into eternal punishment. But we recognize the God that we serve, a God of love, was not willing to do that, was not willing to give up on His creation. But I want to ask you a question today here at the beginning of this lesson. And that is, have you ever realized that you and I were only one man away from never existing? 
want you to notice some words with me from Genesis chapter 6. We're going to read verses 5 through 13 to begin our study today. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And this is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth was also corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Now there are so many lessons that we can learn from this account of Noah. We find that in those days... And brothers and sisters and friends, this concept is one that is beyond my comprehension. But we're told that in those days, mankind had become increasingly evil, so much to the point that God was sorry that he had ever created mankind. So God decided that he was going to bring a worldwide flood, one of such magnitude that it would claim the lives of all human beings. But as God was looking out over the earth and as he was considering those who were living during that time, he found a man who he and his family were worth saving. This man, Noah, we're told, found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And through following God's instructions, he built an ark. And thereby he saved his family from this cataclysmic worldwide flood. Well, after the flood, God promised that he would never flood the earth with water again. And he sealed that promise by placing a rainbow in the sky as an everlasting reminder of God's promise. So what is it that God wants us to see from this account? What is it that we can learn from the story of Noah that will impact us even to this day? Well, first, God wants us to understand why he did what he did. We see that God wants us to realize that mankind had become incredibly evil. He describes the situation this way in Genesis 6, verses 11 through 13. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth, and God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Mankind had reached the point where they had lost all kindness, had lost all compassion. Genesis 6 and verse 5 says that the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And that, notice this, every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. In our life, we have experienced the effects of evil men. Many of you viewing this program today have lived through many atrocities where evil men have facilitated great uh, acts of terror against innocent human lives. But none of us have ever seen anything like what Moses experienced. The concept that on the face of this earth there was only one faithful family. And that everyone else was bent on violence and evil continually. Even the thoughts and the intents of their heart was evil continually. Unless they were hurting someone, taking advantage of someone, they weren't happy. All they were focused upon was, them, uh, was themselves. What they wanted, what they needed. It got so bad that after a while, people stopped thinking in terms of right and wrong, and they got to thinking in terms of what do we need to do to survive and to get by. So we noticed what they did. They resorted to this carnal, animalistic type of life. 
a life where the fittest survived and the weakest were weeded out. Needless to say, this would have been a very terrifying time to live. A time when we cannot imagine the scope of the evil that was surrounding Noah day in and day out. And imagine with me what it would be like if you and your family were the only faithful people on the face of the earth. No, times were not easy for Noah. He lived in very difficult days. But also we find that although there were no doubt constant pressures placed upon Noah to give up on God, to go with the flow, to, to fall in with the ways of the world, this one family stood against that tide of evil. This one family displayed this one light of goodness and faithfulness in this world of complete and total darkness. In that world of incredible evil, the family of Noah was that lone faithful influence. Listen to what was said of this man in Genesis 6 verses 8 and 9. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. But what was it about Noah that caused him to be seen as righteous in the eyes of God? Well, verse 9 gives us the answer to that question. He walked with God. He lived according to God's will. And as such, that devotion that he showed to God is what God viewed as being marks of righteousness in his life. What this meant was that he was fully devoted to doing the Lord's will and, and, and seeking to serve God. Rather than choosing to engage in evil along with all of his other peers, all of the rest of his race, Noah made that daily conscious decision that he was going to follow God. And apparently he taught his family to do the same because his family was allowed to be spared from the flood as well. Well, as this account continues, we're told four times that Noah did all that God commanded him. Now, there's a great lesson for us in each of those passages. If we're going to walk with God, if we're going to appear righteous before God, then we have to be willing to follow God all the way, not just in the things that are convenient, not just in the things that we may like or enjoy or want to be a part of. No, if we're going to appear righteous to God, then we're going to have to follow God all the way, be devoted to Him 100%. Now, we do not live in a world like Noah lived in. We do not live in a world where only one family is faithful. We do not live in a world where the thoughts and intents of every man's heart is on evil continually, but we do still have evil influences around us. We are still pressured day in and day out to give up on God, to fall in with the ways of the world. And whenever we make that decision that we're going to remain faithful to God, Oftentimes, we're going to be criticized. We're going to be looked down upon. We may even be belittled and mocked. But let me ask you this. Do you think Noah faced those same things? Do you think the people living around Noah laughed at him? Do you think they mocked him and belittled him? After all, here was a man building a boat many, many miles inland from any large body of water to avoid a cataclysmic event, the like that had never been seen on the earth before. And then, after all of that, he tells them the way that this is going to be facilitated is in a way that they could not comprehend. He said, this is going to come about because it's going to rain. Well, many of the people in those days, I'm sure, said, Noah, what are you talking about? We don't know what rain is. It's not rained on earth before. In fact, Genesis 2 and verse 6 tells us that in those days that a mist came up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And so here you have Noah not only speaking out against their sinfulness, telling them they need to repent, but also here he is daily building this boat as a constant reminder to those people of the things that Noah has been teaching. 
and for over a hundred years he devotes himself to this. But despite all the criticism of his peers, Noah continued to warn the people. He continued to work on that ark day in and day out. He continued to warn the people of God's anger and their need to change. But sadly, all of those with the exception of Noah and his family who were living on earth at this time, they simply overlooked Noah. They shrugged their shoulders at him, they belittled and criticized him, but they wouldn't listen to the things that he had to say. But to the people of Noah's day, that ark became a constant reminder to them of the message that Noah had preached, that condemnation was coming upon them because of their unfaithful state. No, they didn't accept that message. But it was constantly before them. A constant reminder. And we find that oftentimes when people find themselves being called out for sin, standing condemned by the word of God, they tend to do more than just laugh and shrug off the accusations. They tend to get nasty, mean-spirited, sometimes even violent in their words and their actions. And this is exactly the type of behavior that Jesus said his followers would have to face. In Matthew chapter 5 verses 10 through 12, Jesus said, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. We see today that just like with the ark in the days of Noah, a faithful Christian life is a constant reminder to those who are living in sin of the changes that they need to make. Is a constant reminder that they stand condemned by God. And as Jesus said, people in that kind of situation, they're going to persecute those that stand opposed to them. Paul later on addressed this matter in 2 Corinthians 2 verses 14 through 16 where he wrote, Now thanks be to God, who always leads us in triumph in Christ, and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved, and among those who are perishing. To the one we are the aroma of death leading to death, and to the other the aroma of life leading to life. We see the faithful actions of Christians make those who are unfaithful, those who are unbelievers, very uncomfortable. Possibly it causes them to feel the wrongness that is in the actions that they are engaging in and it causes them to have to confront head on the reality of their sinfulness. Now thankfully with some individuals this will open their eyes. It will cause them to recognize a need to change and some will come to Christ. Some will obey the gospel and have their sins washed away in the waters of baptism. But many others will be offended. Many others will turn inward because we find that sinfulness will always be offended by righteousness. And this offense will lead to many different forms of persecution. They'll even resort to being critical of God in an attempt to soothe their own convicted hearts. Well, this is why we hear many in the world today argue that God must not be this loving, forgiving God that he has portrayed in the scriptures because he was willing to kill every man, woman, and child on the face of this earth with the exception of Noah and his family. But that claim makes an incorrect assumption. It assumes that those who died in the flood were innocent. It assumes that those who died in the flood were people whose lives were not so corrupted by sin that God just simply could not stand it any longer. It's kind of like when you go into the kitchen and you go to make a sandwich and you take the loaf of bread out, you open it and you look inside 
and you notice that you've waited a little too long to eat that bread, and you look down in there and the first couple pieces of that bread has mold on it. Well, most people, I'm sure, would take and throw out the entire loaf and go get a new loaf. You're not going to take out just those first two slices or three slices, whatever has the mold growing on it. And the reason that is is because the influence of that mold will have tainted the rest of that loaf of bread. And so whenever we think about this concept of the actions of God in the days of Noah, God looked upon a moldy, decaying, corrupted lot of people. Even those children that lost their lives in the flood had been influenced by the wicked behaviors of their parents. And as a result of that, they were not seen as innocent in this decision. They were not seen as ones who would change. When God considered each individual, he considered the hearts, he considered the intents, and he recognized only one righteous family, that of Noah and his family. But another aspect that set Noah apart from the rest of the mankind is the fact that Noah was a preacher of righteousness, according to 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5. No, he wasn't just a shipbuilder. He wasn't just a zookeeper. He was a preacher. He was a prophet. He declared the word of God to his, uh, to his generation. He devoted 120 years to preaching this message of repentance. You see, because of the faithful actions of Noah, it shows us that God has not completely given up on mankind. It shows us that due to the righteousness of that one man, and God certainly used Noah to preach that need to change. His message was like the signs that we see along roadways today, especially in low-lying areas along bodies of water. Turn around, don't drown. You know, there's a flood coming. You need to repent. Turn your life around. Avoid this punishment to come. But once again, showing the love, the compassion, and the devotion of God in wanting to spare the lives of anyone who would be faithful to Him, we find in Genesis 7 and verse 10 that even after the ark was complete, even after all of the animals had gotten on board, even after Noah and his family were on board, God waited seven days before the flood came. You see, God was holding out hope. That as people saw these events progressing as Noah had prophesied, that their eyes would open and that they would come to him in repentance. But no one did that. We find that they were too far gone, they were too corrupt, they were too jaded by sin. And so they met the consequence of their sins. Death. Well folks, we realize that sadly when Jesus comes again, the fate of many is going to be the same as those in the days of Noah. They will not have listened to the word of God. They will not have made those changes in their life to become faithful to God. No, they're not going to be destroyed by a flood of water. God has promised that that will not happen again. But this time, they will be lost as a result of being fully engulfed in a lake of fire. This is the consequence of living a life of sin. On that day, those who are judged as evil, they're not going to have any excuse. Peter said in 2 Peter 3, verses 9 and 10, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but His long-suffering is patient to us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. And the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Just as God provided the ark as a shelter, as a place of safety to avoid that punishment that was to come, God has provided us with an ark as well. The ark that he has provided for us is the body of Christ, the church. We enter into that body of Christ and as such, we will be spared so long as we live a life of faithfulness to God. We will be spared from that judgment that is to come. And God has made that possible for each and every one of us 
because of the love that he has for us. And just as he displayed his patience for 120 years in the days of Noah and then waited an additional seven days before sending the flood, we find that God continues to be patient with you and I, waiting for those who are outside of that ark of safety to come to him, to repent of their sins and obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so whenever we consider this as one of the great gifts that God has given to us, Indeed, his sparing of mankind in the days of Noah has made it possible for you and I to be his children, has made it possible for you and I to have the hope of a home in heaven. The love and the patience that he continues to have for mankind is indeed a great gift and that he is allowing more and more to have an opportunity to come to him. We need to be thankful each and every day for this great and this wondrous gift that God has given to us. We want to thank you for joining us for this study of God's Word today. And we pray that God will bless you with a wonderful day. If you have a Bible question, would like to receive a free Bible correspondence course, would like a copy of free books, please contact the Nettleton Church of Christ Speaking the Truth in Love is brought to you by these area churches of Christ. Speaking the Truth in Love can be viewed online at nettletonchurchofchrist.org.